Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible and turn to the book of Leviticus. We're going to look at the 23rd chapter. We're going to look at the holy days, which is where we get the word holiday, uh, God's festivals and feasts, and how they tie in into the God's plan of salvation. Yes, God's holy days were an outline looking forward to the plan of salvation. Now, the Old Testament was a type and shadow, and then the T New Testament was a partial fulfillment. You had the spring and summer festivals, and then you had the fall festivals, and we're going to go into that. The spring festivals have been done, but the fall festivals have not. So, with that in mind, Leviticus 23. And oh, by the way, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If you hit my YouTube channel, and on the upper right-hand side, there's a, like a little magnifying glass. If you want to learn more about the Passover as opposed to Easter, uh, I've done a lot of work on Passover and the unleavened bread. Now, if you have a good dictionary, I mean a good one, and you look up Easter... Easter is actually a name of the spring goddess of fertility. She has many, many, many names. Uh, Semiramis, Ishtar, Isis, Diana, uh, the, some say the Shekinah, some say Lilith. Um, you know, the goddess has got a lot of different names. I mean, a lot of different names. Now, please understand, I am not a trained Levitical priest. Uh, those people were trained from a very, very young age. And they wouldn't even take office until they were 25 years old. So, you got to figure, if they were trained from the time they were 12 to 25, uh, you're probably talking about somebody that had a double doctorate degree. I mean, you know, think about it. But uh, possibly even started younger than that. I don't know. But I'm just some guy that's uh, read the Bible once or twice, and uh, I've been putting this off for a long, long time, but I figured, well, may as well do it. I have a feeling the end of my ministry on the internet is, well, getting close, uh, coming to an end. I just have this feeling. Uh, so, with that in mind, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. We're going to read the entire chapter, and then I'll go back and add stuff to it. You know, and that's the thing. When did the so-called church change the Lord's Passover into bunny rabbits and an Easter egg hunt named after a spring goddess of fertility? I mean, let's face it, rabbits, you know. Uh, Hugh Hefner, anybody? Playboy? What is their uh, symbol? A rabbit, right? I mean, come on. But then, if you think uh, you'd like to uh, follow the feast days, well, then you either get hooked up into the Hebrew roots people or uh, people call you a legalist. It's amazing, though. If you want to kind of honor God's holy days, um, they call you a legalist. But if you put up the tree in December, Jeremiah chapter 10, 
uh, they'll argue about how much liberty they have to do that. But if you do what God says to do, well, then you're a legalist and you're going to hell because you're trying to earn your salvation or whatever other nonsensical arguments they can do. Now, I'm not saying we should follow the, um, the holy days. We should know about them. It's in the Bible. But my point is, uh, Jesus changed the law. People love to say, oh, that false apostle Paul, he changed the law. Um, but no, it wasn't Paul that changed the law. It was Christ. Let's take a look real quick. I've said it dozens of times, and I'm going to say it again. So someone asked Jesus, what was the most important commandment in the law? And then in Matthew 22 and verse 36, well, he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And hopefully you don't have a bunch of witches and Satanists as your neighbors. Okay? I, you know, you were supposed to live among your own people, among your own kind. At least that was separation and segregation. That was the original plan. Of course, your social justice warriors uh, won't don't like you to do that. They do that. They live in their little gated communities, but they don't want you to do that. No, you have to live with the heathens. They live among their own kind. It's uh, do as they say, not do as they do. So, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Listen carefully. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And you know what? G uh, that's even... Jesus is kind of paraphrasing from the Old Testament. I mean, you know. So, who changed the law? Paul, who they claim is a false apostle, or Jesus? Well, they'll never point out that Jesus did it, because, you know, well, they don't call him Jesus. They like to call him Yeshua or whatever thing, but, all right, so do we have to keep the Sabbath like the Seventh-day Adventists tell us we have to do? Uh, well, if you love the Lord and you love your neighbor, um, according to Jesus, no, no, you don't. Now, remember, in John, John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Which, love the Lord, love thy neighbor, right? Now, in Galatians chapter 5, oh boy, we're going to read some words of Paul here. And, uh, well, let's just read it. But the fruit of the Spirit, what Spirit? The Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Boy, in today's times, with what's going on, it's pretty hard to have joy and peace. I kind of have peace. I don't know about joy. I think I understand kind of, sort of, how Jeremiah must have felt knowing that God's righteous judgment was coming. You know, by the way, today is November 24th, 2020. Just for a point of reference. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 
peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So if you're led of the Spirit, there is no law. Oh my God, Chaplain Bob, that's terrible. Paul's a false apostle, I'll tell you. Well, don't listen to those devils. They don't know Paul, and they don't know the person that sent Paul, which was Christ. I mean, you know, to, to deny Paul, you got to ignore the book of Acts, and you got to throw away 2 Peter, which acknowledges Paul as a brother in the faith. You know, I mean, really, you're going to throw away the book of Acts, and then they'll tell you, oh, well, Paul's a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and, you know, he, he infiltrated the apostles. Really? You're going to tell me the, the apostles were performing miracles? They were healing people? They were casting out devils? They were speaking in languages that they didn't know, other tongues? And you're going to tell me the Holy Spirit failed to warn people that Paul was a false apostle? Really? Oh, okay. So I'm supposed to believe you and ignore the Bible, right? That's what they want you to do. So, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Wow. So that's some pretty good stuff, huh? Now in Galatians 2.16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, you know, if you want to keep Christmas and put up a tree and ignore Jeremiah chapter 10, hey, that's up to you. You want to do the spring goddess of fertility with the Playboy bunny? I mean, the uh, I'm sorry, the Easter bunny? And uh, sing, uh, Here comes Peter Cottontail, Coming down the money trail, Hippity hoppity, Easter's on the way. Oh yeah, that's, that, that really is so uplifting for Christ, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, alright, uh, I've been jabbering for almost 14 minutes here, so let's get, let's get to work. Leviticus chapter 23. I have a feeling this is going to be a multi-part study. And uh, I just did the introduction, so, you know. But yeah, it, it, it kills me. People will uh, fight and defend doing things the Bible says not to do. And then the things the Bible says you should do, they say you're a legalist if you do it. Now, another one other thing, other point I want to make, look. Uh, I know, according to the you-know-whos, Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown, according to them, is the Sabbath. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if Sunday is actually the Sabbath. It wouldn't surprise me that somewhere down the line over the last 1900 years time was changed it wouldn't surprise me i mean they have such com control and there are such few believers it will not surprise me if sunday was actually the sun uh, sabbath and besides who named it sun day S-U-N-D-E-A-Y. It's not S-O-N-Day. No, 
It's not the day of the Son of God. No, it's the day of the sun in the sky. Who named it that? Who named the planet Venus after a goddess? Who named the planet Mars after the god of war? Jupiter? Saturn? I mean, come on. Oh, and I did a video on the cult of Saturn. Do you know Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun, according, if you believe, astronomy? Is that a coincidence? Man was created on the sixth day. Man's number, the number of a man is 666. I mean, really? You know, it makes you wonder. I, you know, I don't know what to believe anymore. If it's not in the Bible, I don't necessarily believe it. If it's in the Bible, I believe it, but only in the King James. You know, Geneva, Webster, yeah. All these other modern Bibles come from uh, Catholic-controlled manuscripts. And be real careful about those Dead Sea Scrolls, people, because uh, no Christian, real Christian scholar that I know of has ever been allowed to examine them, and they're in the control of the Antichrist. So keep that in mind, please. Uh, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 7 real quick. Uh, this seems to indicate it'll. this particular instance will happen at the end of time of us on Earth. Um, but I wonder if there was an application in the past. I know that the calendars have been changed several times. You got the Julian calendar, you got the Gregorian calendar, uh, the you know who's have their own little calendar. Uh, the Buddhists have their own little calendar. Uh, everybody's, you know. So let's read this real quick. Daniel 7, verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think, listen carefully, and think to change times and laws. Ah, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. So, I don't know. Did this Is this all future or did this happen in our past? I, you know, sometimes I wonder. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Now, um, the Noahide laws, they're going to, he's going to exchange, probably, my opinion, my guess, is exchange the seven Noahide laws that don't exist in the Bible. They, they only exist in the mind's of um, rab buys, um, you know that's the only place these laws exist. They don't exist in the Bible, you know. But uh, probably replace the seven laws with the uh, for the Ten Commandments. You know, get rid of the Ten Commandments and replace them with the seven laws. I don't know. All right, let's let's read Leviticus twenty three. I've spent. Too much time doing an introduction here. I have a feeling this is going to be a multi-part study. I will probably, maybe I'll make this a two-parter. I, yeah, I hate doing that. All right, here's the deal. Leviticus chapter 23. And if you ever read the book of Leviticus, uh, you should read it in conjunction with the book of Hebrews. Uh, 
because Hebrews replaces the book of Leviticus. I mean, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was very scholarly. Well, I'm sure they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but uh, some people theorize that uh, Paul was probably the author of Hebrews, but he didn't attach his name to it, probably because if that is true, he didn't want um, the uh, true Hebrews of Judah to uh, discount his work because of the uh, fightings that he had with the uh, Antichrist claiming to be Judah. All right, Leviticus 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Uh, all right, we're talking about the holy days, right? Where we get the word holiday. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, what was the Sabbath for? It was a day of rest. Uh, Jesus said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. And he said that uh, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. We weren't made to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. One day a week uh, so that all Israel and their servants could have a day of rest and recuperation, especially farming. I mean, farming was hard work, still is unless you got a couple million dollars worth of uh, farm equipment, you know, as long as you got diesel to run your stuff, right? But uh, it was a day to relax and rest and to reflect upon the things of the Lord. That was the day that people went to the temple or synagogue or whatever, house of worship, and uh, read, the, uh, read the books of the law, at least in this time. And, uh, you know, it was a day of reflecting upon the goodness of the Lord. Boy, I wish we would do that, you know. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up in a few days. And uh, what has Thanksgiving turned into? It used to be when the Pilgrims and Puritans were here, it was a day of thanksgiving, giving thanks to the Lord for the bountiful harvest and being able to have a feast and being able to take all the food and store it for the winter when you couldn't grow food. So, you know, but what has Thanksgiving turned into? Uh, it's a day you stuff yourself, gluttony, you get drunk, drinking beer, and then you scream at the television because your football game team has scored a touchdown or they're losing or whatever. Um, girls know what I'm talking about. But uh, And then the day after, what is it? Oh, Black Friday. Yay! I'm going to go out and uh, stand in line for six hours in the cold or whatever in front of Wally Mart and so I can get that flat screen TV that's on sale, you know. Yeah, so I can watch that filth on television. Yeah, does that sound like uh, honoring the Lord? Um, yeah, I don't think so. Well, which Lord? Not the God of Abraham, not the God of Isaac, not the God of Jacob, not the God of Moses, not the God of the Bible, not the God of David the King. No, absolutely not.
Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at even, is the Lord's Passover. Uh, here's another point of contention. Some people say it's set the year by the moon. Others say it's by the lunar or solar. I don't know. I'm not a trained Levitical priest. Um, I don't even know if I'm of the tribe of Levi. You know, I'm just saying. But um, there was a... From what I understand, it um, now I could be wrong. I'm just throwing this out there because this is what I've heard or read or whatever, and I'm not sure of the source. I'll be honest with you. But there's two times of the year when the day and night are closest to being equal in length. They're almost exactly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. It's the uh, equinox, uh, the spring and fall equinox. From what I understand, 14 days after that, um, something about a crescent moon or whatever, I'm not sure how that works. So, you know, don't hold me to it. I don't know how to uh, set these exact days. But 14 days after, after that event was the Passover. Two weeks. Okay? Two weeks. Remember, the Lord created everything on six days and seventh day he rested. Uh, the thing is that um, God's calendar starts in the spring. Yeah, you know, when did we start a brand new year, you know, December 31st, January 1st? I mean, what's up with that? When the sun went down was the beginning of the new day at the even, the evening. We start our new day at midnight. Oh, 1201, uh, one minute after, you know, one, one second after midnight, up, oh, it's the new day. Uh, did they change the times? Yes. Yes, they did. And why do we have the new year start in the winter? God's, day, God's year started in the spring. It was an agricultural type thing. Didn't the Lord uh, liken his second coming as a gathering of a harvest? The harvesting of the souls? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll probably go more into that. So um, somebody remind me if I do make this a second part. Um, you know, harvest. You had an agricultural harvest. You got a harvest of souls, right? So, all right. Leviticus 23, verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now, I've done numerous studies on Passover numerous um, all the plagues of Egypt um, the hail the darkness the um, the fire that ran on the ground the the water turning into blood the three days of darkness the the flies the lice the frogs those were all challenges to the gods of Egypt they had a god frog. They had a Nile god. They had a, uh, a god of light. Um, and they mimic, in many ways, some ways, uh, the plagues of Revelation. And I did an entire playlist on that as well. You know, I've got over a thousand Bible studies, people. A thousand, over a thousand. And uh, sometimes I do similar studies on same topic, but approach it from a different angle. So, you know, it just never, if you 
if you use a different Bible than the King James, you don't make the connections that you would with a modern Bible because they change the words. For example, you know, uh, in, in one of the plagues of Egypt was when the hail of Egypt hit the ground, it said flames ran around the ground. Or maybe it said fire, I forget. But when you go to the New Testament, it might use a different word. Instead of flame, they'll use fire. Or instead of fire, they'll use flames. Yeah, I know. You, you think, well, that's a small point. But, you know, a lot of times the New Testament will use this almost the exact same language as the Old Testament does. They want you to make that word connection so that the idea between the old and the new, you make the connection. And the Lord always shows you what's the future by showing you the past. That's why I spend so much time in the Old Testament. And I've had pastors try to talk me out of reading the Old Testament. Oh, don't read that. That's for the Jews. Uh, we're not Jews. We're New Testament Christians. Ugh. Didn't take me long to leave that church. Yeah. Yeah, I hurt my back and uh, had to sleep in my truck in the middle of the winter. It was 17 degrees one day. Think the pastor let me sleep on his couch? No. Nope. No, he sure wouldn't. I asked him, eh, my house is too crowded, sorry. And uh, this is a ch church I was stupid enough to give money to. I got to admit, my dad was pretty smart. My dad was, in some ways, when he came to the Lord, he wasn't smart. But he says, Bob, let me tell you something. You give all this money to these damn churches, they won't do nothing for you. You'll find out, sure enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you're giving money to them, they put their arm around you and, oh, Brother Bob, we love you. Yeah, you're so great. And then when you when you need something from them, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, my house is too crowded. You're sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I tell you what, the Lord gave me a lesson. Well, a lot of lessons. So, all right, so vernal equinox, the spring equinox, 14 days approximately later, uh, verse 5, in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. All right, so what was the thing about the Passover? You had the spotless lamb. You slayed the lamb. You put the blood on the doorpost. The, um, the um, angel of death passed over your house. Well, what's the deal with the unleavened bread? Well, leaven is always likened unto sin. Always. Unless somebody can prove me wrong. There's a scripture in the New Testament where it talks about the woman that put the uh, uh, three measures of meal and then it leavened. And then they, uh, I've actually read where pastors try to turn that into being a good thing. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But like I say, what do I know? I'm just some guy that's read the Bible. All right, so... The thing about the unleavened bread, we were supposed to go through the house and get rid of all the yeast and all the leavening out of the house. We were supposed to eat uh, bread. Well, what was the connection with bread? Didn't, you know, didn't Jesus say he was the bread of life? You know, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? The Passover lamb? He was the bread of life, uh, no leavening, which was likened unto sin. He was a sinless lamb, right? All right. We're going to go more into this, that in the detail. Verse 7. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Uh, servile work. 
servant work. Okay, you don't go to your um, job making whatever. Say you're making uh, television sets. Okay, you know, you can go and pull your sheep out of a hole, a ditch. Okay, you can water your flock. Okay, uh, that's not really servile work. That's just taking care of the, the family, more or less, I guess. You know? But, uh, you know, don't go to your factory job. That's, that was the idea. All right. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Verse 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest therein, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now, I'm not a farmer. Okay, well, let's read the next one. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow. After the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf, and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So, waving the sheaf offering. Um, from what I understand, uh, there was two harvests in Israel's thing. You had the early harvest. Uh, from what I understand is the barley. And then later, you would have the wheat harvest. Uh, from what I understand, barley uh, came quicker. Uh, barley bread was kind of considered the poor man's food because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't taste that good. I believe, I believe, uh, let me make sure of something here. Yeah, I wanted to make sure. Uh, beer is made from barley, uh, what they call malted barley, uh, what they call uh, maltose. Anything with an O-S-E at the end is a sugar. You've heard of sucrose, lactose, uh, well, you got maltose. And what they do is they sprout the barley, and then they, well, they have it in a vat, and they let it sprout, and then they add the uh, yeast to it, and the yeast converts the, um, uh, it converts it, whatever, the, the, the sugars or starches or whatever into alcohol. And then you get beer. You know, so that's, that was, um, and beer is an ancient thing. I mean, it's ancient. I wouldn't be surprised if they had it back in biblical days. Um. I mean, it's it's an absolute. Uh, in Germany, oh my, <laughs> the the law to buy, the the law the drinking age in Germany is, uh, if you can ask for a beer and you got the money, they'll give it to you. I mean, that's that's the drinking age in Germany. Uh, it's just part of their culture. So. So. You had the first fruits, okay? And I'm kind of of the impression Christ was the first fruit of the resurrection. All right? And perhaps a shadow of things was uh, I did a Bible study on this. So if you're interested, let me know. I'll send you the link. Prior to Christ, everybody that died went to a special compartment in hell. Uh, it was the non-smoking section, if you catch my drift. It was the non-flaming section, I should say. Um, yeah, the non-smoking section of hell. It was called Abraham's bosom. All the Old Testament saints went there. 
Everybody else went to the uh, smoking section. Yeah. And then um, Christ went down there for three days and three nights. He said he for three days and three nights he'd be in the heart of the earth. The sign of the prophet Jonas. Okay? Uh, this is a whole Bible study in and of itself. Probably take an hour. I don't remember how long it was, but, you know. But I'm not making this stuff up. So, Christ preached to the spirits in prison. Hell was, uh, hell was prison. Let's face it. And then um, they ascended up to heaven. And they are awaiting their resurrected bodies. So, Christ was the first fruits. Matter of fact, after Christ rose from the grave, um, there were some people that died who arose from the graves and went into Jerusalem. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Uh, let me read that real quick. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, that is in Matthew 27. So this might have been the... Um, the first harvest. Matthew 27, verse 50. This is the crucifixion, people. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So he died. All right. Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Wow. Can you imagine that? Is that something or what? All right, so back to Leviticus 23. So there's an early harvest, and then there's going to be the fall harvest. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to cover that a little bit later. Verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. And he shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil. An offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. Don't ask me what a hen is. It's some kind of measurement. I don't know. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Um... What's easier, following all these little rules and laws or uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these hang all the laws and the prophets. Uh, I want to go back to my Hebrew roots so I can keep uh, 600 and something laws because cause I don't want to believe in Jesus. I want to, I want to keep all these laws. Are you really kidding me? Really, people? These Hebrew roots people, unbelievable. Yeah, I'm being sarcastic there. It's a lot easier to believe on the Lord and his righteousness than to keep 600 different laws. And every time these people ask me about uh, keeping all these laws, I ask them, did you pay the soldiers ransom? Uh, uh, what? The soldiers what? The soldiers ransom. You're supposed to give them a piece of silver for the, a soldier's ransom. Did you do that? Uh, where's that at? Well, it's 
it's in the Torah, dude. You know, you, you want to keep Torah? You want to keep your Hebrew roots? Wow, you missed one of those laws. I mean, I guess that means you're going to hell because you didn't keep the law. Don't ask me where the soldier's ransom is. I, I've, I've read it. I know it's in there. Uh, I think it's easier to believe in Jesus. What do you think? All right. Verse 15. All right. Well, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Verse 15. 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. What is seven Sabbaths? Ah, what's seven times seven? Seven Sabbaths. Forty-nine. Ah, verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days. Ah, what's up with the fifty days, dude? And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Well, guess what? In the New Testament, that was called Pentecost. 50. Penta. I think it's Latin for 50. Penta. Yeah, that's right. Remember, you got a pentagram? That's a symbol of the you-know-whos. Not, uh, not the six-pointed, but the five-pointed. Penta. 50 days. Wasn't that when um, when, the whole, when the Holy Spirit came to the uh, apostles? Yeah, it did. And we're going to go into that. I'm just doing an overview right now. Verse 17. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven... They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Ah, Pentecost was among the first fruits of the Lord, wasn't it? 18. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. Goats for a sin offering. Isn't it funny how the Satanists pick for their symbol a goat? And if you look at uh, Samael, I think it's S-A-M-A-E-L or Samael, Samael, Sam. Samuel, I don't know. Um, they put a goat's head into the downward facing five pointed star inside a circle for their little symbol. Yeah, I, I just, you know, it's amazing. Uh, God lets them do these things, He, he, he allows it. You know, I mean, it's funny. Um, Jesus said that he would put the, the sheep on his right hand and the, the goats on the left. Well, what are the communists and the socialists, what do they call themselves? Leftists. They know they're on the left hand of God. They know this. I mean, you know, think about it. They're leftists. Ooh, oh, you, you... You believe in Jesus? Well, you're a right-winger. I hope so. I hope I'm on the right hand of God. I certainly hope so. I want to hear that, Well done, thou faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what I want to hear. And there's a whole bunch of politicians I want to hear. Depart from me that work iniquity. I never knew you. Depart from me uh, into everlasting darkness. Yeah, or whatever. I'm paraphrasing there, but yeah, you get the idea. 
Um, all right. Uh, let's see. All right, verse 20. So, what do you want, goats or lambs? Uh, I pick lambs, but hey. Okay, verse 20. And the priest, not a Catholic priest, shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Now, here's something interesting. Uh, do you know that in the kingdom, they're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? Oh, yeah. When we get to that, I'm, I'll show you. Um, verse 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. What does that mean? It means you don't pick the trees clean or you don't pick the fields clean. You leave stuff on the corner and the edges of your field. Why? Well, neither shalt thou gather any gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Ah, that's why. Okay, I didn't know that, Chaplain Bob. Well, you know, you were supposed to leave the corners and the edges of your field so that the poor of the land could come and they were allowed to go on your land and take as much as they could carry. I mean, you know, that was, that's loving thy neighbor, people. That's loving the Lord and loving thy neighbor. That is faith in action. Read James chapter 2. You can talk about, oh, I love the Lord, I love the neighbor, praise the Jesus. But if you don't leave anything in your field for your neighbors that have bad things happen to them, you know, you're going to tell me you love your neighbors? Really? Do you know in India that I've heard on average two to 3,000 people a day die of starvation. I don't know how true that is. I've heard that. But they export rice. In all the major cities, they have a cart that goes through the city and they pick up all the homeless people that have died. Yeah. And yet they export rice. You've got billionaires. Look at the uh, owner of Tata Motors, T-A-T-A, -T -A, Tata Motors. Think he would give one of the homeless people a bowl of rice? Nah, not on your life. No way. Of course, he, his God is not the God of the Bible, I'm sure. He's probably Krishna or Vishnu or Kali or uh, Brahma or whatever other satanic being God they've got over there. I don't know. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaming, gleaning of the harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, Ah, the seventh day, uh, seventh month. Okay. So now, just so that you know, the first month in the Hebrew uh, uh, calendar would have been around late March, mid-April, somewhere in that time period. It kind of varies. Um. If you look at a compass, and if you ever took geometry in college, uh, a perfect circle 
has 360 degrees. So if the Earth was, well, I don't know. Some people say the Earth circles the sun. I don't know if I believe that. Personally, it wouldn't surprise me if the sun circles the Earth. I've heard that, and I tend to believe that, although I don't know. I've never been up in space. I've never seen it. But, hey, wouldn't surprise me that uh, NASA would lie about everything. Uh, matter of fact, somebody showed me that NASA, one of the root words for NASA in Hebrew actually means deceive. Um it's in Strong's Concordance. It's not the actual. You gotta, you gotta look it up. Um, I'd have to look it up again. So I looked it up first, and I says, "No, nah, that's not true." But then they said, "No, no, no, Bob. You gotta look up uh, a couple of the reference words, the root words." And I did, and sure enough, it was right. NASA actually means to deceive in Hebrew. But can you imagine if the Earth stood still? and wasn't circling the sun. And the sun and the universe revolved around the earth. Uh, would that prove a creator or what? It would prove that we are the center of God's universe. I mean, the, whoa, think about that. I mean, that's like, whoa, dude, that's heavy, man, far out. Yeah, I grew up in that generation. So, but the point is, in a perfect circle, a year would be 12 months of 30 days, which would be 360 degrees. Um, according to the astrological, astronomical, I'm sorry, astronomical calculations, the year is about 365 days and a quarter. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, they, they lie to us so much. They lie to us even when they don't have to lie to us. It's, yeah. So, all right. So, uh, let me calculate something here real quick. I got to pause. All right, now remember, the beginning of the year, the Hebrew calendar as an agricultural calendar, spring. Let's say, for the sake of argument, March 30th. All right, what would be the seventh month? Well, you got April, May, June, July, August, September, October. October is when things start cooling off. Uh, that's your harvest, okay? That is your fall festivals, of which hasn't occurred as far as the New Testament is concerned. We'll go more into that in a minute. Leviticus 23, verse 23. Leviticus 23, 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, around October, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Um, where do we have trumpets mentioned in the New Testament? Huh, let's see. Um, the book of Revelation. Yeah. How many trumpets are there? Seven. And the Bible teaches you that we're changed at the last trump. And guess what? There's seven trumps, trumpets, seven trumps, not Donald. He's not one of them. Sorry. But uh, there's seven trumps. And the seventh one is the last one is at the end of the tribulation. That's when we're changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Which means uh, the pre-trib rapture is wrong. Uh, what, Chaplain Bob? You think you think you're so smart, and all these other Bible teachers are are 
are you, you think you're right and they're all wrong who do you think you are um nobody but let's take a look well and they always quote first thessalonians 4 16 for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout yeah because a secret rapture always comes with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god sorry not donald and the dead in christ shall rise first now that's the pre-trib rapture proof verse they tell you but my verse is in first corinthians 15 52 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump there's not a last trump prior to the tribulation there are seven trumps the seventh one is the last one and is at the end of the tribulation in the book of Revelation. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What? Chaplain Bob, how do you... What? Well, I'm sorry. You know, hey, I, I'm not uh, I'm not here begging tithes from you people, okay? My treasures are in heaven, I hope. I hope the Lord can put up with me. That's all I can tell you. All right, verse 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation, Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Huh. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Atonement. Look at that word. At one meant. Meant. At one meant atonement at one with God it shall be in holy convocation unto you and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord what does that mean afflict your souls it was a day of prayer and repentance and fasting that's afflicting your soul that was a day of fasting. I haven't been very good about that. Verse 28. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whosoever shall, so, uh, for, for whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Even, that's where we get the word evening. The setting of the sun was the beginning of the day, not midnight. Who changed all this stuff? Who named the days of the week after God's? Greco, Greco Roman gods. Who? Who named the planets after Greco Roman gods? I mean, not me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me, dude. Uh uh. All right. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even to even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. Very interesting. 
Some called it the Feast of Booths. Um, it was people were to dwell in tents. I wonder if this has reference to the tribulation period when Revelation 12, when the woman goes into the wilderness. Boy, don't talk this stuff in a pre-trib rapture church. They'll, uh, you'll be told to leave so fast you'll say, wow, what happened? Yeah. You know, it's a type and shadow. The Old Testament's a type of shadow of things to come in the New Testament, people. I don't make this stuff up, you know. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be in holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by the Lord, uh, made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything upon this day. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, beside your gifts and beside all your vows and beside all your free will offerings, which ye give unto the Lord. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land. Ah, here's the, here's the, uh, the fall harvest. So you got to, a, 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 like a summer harvest and then you got the fall harvest a lot of people don't know it but uh, radishes do you know that in three weeks you can get a harvest of radishes oh yeah but if you plant corn or wheat or beans it takes about three to three and a half months uh, well that's if you get good weather you don't get winds that are excessive that you get rain in due season, um, you know. So you've got a early harvest, and then you got the fall harvest. Sometimes I actually sound like I know what I'm talking about, don't I? Well, don't fool yourself. I don't. I got an idea, but I I absolutely don't know all the time what I'm talking about, but. Yeah. Verse 39. And, and all, uh, let's see. All right. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees... Branches of palm trees. Ah, what did the people do when Jesus went into Jerusalem after the, the Lord, the Last Supper? Didn't they cut down palm fronds and throw it up across the road when he rode in on the, um, the foal of an ass? Huh. Yeah, I think they did. Hmm. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. What's a booth? I mean, come on, you go to the uh, flea market. What's a booth? It's like a, like a tent, right? Like a little, uh, like a, a house made out of canvas. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. I wonder if this is reference to uh, when the church goes into the wilderness during the tribulation period. I don't know. That's what it looks like to me. 
We're going to cover that more. This is going to be a part one. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Yes, God brought Israel out of Egypt because he wanted to get Egypt out of Israel. And when the Lord takes the church into the wilderness, he's going to take his church out of Babylon because he wants to get Babylon out of the church. You know, I made a very, very detailed study of Babylon. Um, I think his name was Alexander Hislop, H-I-S-L-O-P. He did the two Babylons where he blames everything on the Vatican. I mean, you know, the book is partly right, but he left out a whole bunch of information that he could have. Uh, people like that, their whole, either they don't see the uh, trees for the forest or the forest for the trees, you know, blaming everything on the Vatican is, the Vatican's guilty of much, but I'm sorry, they're not guilty of everything. But I made an in-depth study of Babylon, and let me tell you something. There's a lot of satanic stuff in churches. A lot. A lot. And there's a lot of satanic stuff in uh the you know who's religion too. I mean it's everywhere. But I studied um, the occult for about a year when I first came to the Lord. Matter of fact, I had people try to talk me out of it that were church kind of church people. And they said, Bob, you ought to be studying what the, the Bible says, not what the, the occult people are doing. And, you know, I prayed to the Lord, Lord, please protect me, because I knew that stuff was evil. And I believe he did. He, he honored my prayer, because I wanted to know what this garbage was in the churches. I, I went to the, the satanic sources to find the, what they taught and believed, and their symbols. And believe me, people, they have so many symbols that they communicate with each other with. And when you've seen those symbols, and if you want to get a good book, um, I think it's Mackey. Uh, I think it's Symbols of the Masonic Lodge. Uh, I think it's Mackey. But uh, when you see those, when you read those symbols and you look at them, you look at them, all these big companies use these logos that are these symbols. You see these symbols on television and churches um, for example, the Mormon church, uh, their little tabernacle thing in uh, Salt Lake City is full of satanic and, and Masonic symbols. And they'll tell their members, oh, the Masonic Lodge is bad. Don't, don't join the Masonic Lodge. Well, if you went to a Masonic Lodge and you looked at all the symbols all over the, their little buildings, and then you went back to the Salt Lake City and looked at their temple, you'd see the same symbols. They don't want you to make the connections. But uh, my point is, I studied all this Satanism so that I would recognize it in the churches. And when you see all these preachers on TBN and 700 Club doing these little Masonic hand signs and their little satanic symbols all over their little podiums and in the background and stuff, you know who they serve. That stuff's not there by accident. They know they know what they're doing. And and I get people say, "Oh, Bob, you're just you're just too hard on these people. They, you know, they're doing it ignorantly." No, they're not. You don't get in charge of a 700 million dollar empire with television network stations all over the United States by being a misguided true believer. I'm sorry. I don't believe that. And if I'm wrong, I'll have to apologize to them one day. But uh, I don't think so. So, you know, what can I tell you? All right. Um, so, 
that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. All right. This is going to be the end of part one. Part two, I'm going to cover a little bit more in depth um, the Old Testament feasts and their implications. And then I'll contrast that with the New Testament. Because the spring festivals uh, all the way to Pentecost have been fulfilled. So Passover... Unleavened bread and Pentecost were fulfilled already, but we've still got some fall festivals, uh, you know, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, uh, the last great day. Those haven't been fulfilled yet. They're coming, but they haven't been fulfilled yet. So um, I pray that you'll uh, found some interesting things, you know, I helped your Bible knowledge increase. Um you know, I'm here to feed the sheep. I don't know for how long, but I'm here. And uh, I don't know how long I'll be here. So please, people, keep me in your prayers. Um, you know, I, I try to warn people, but some people don't want to be warned. They want to believe the world. They want to believe their pastors. Um, you know, what can I tell you? All right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>